Right, well, I've been inspired by you, not for the first time, all. Um, you remember last week, uh, last month, sorry, you pitched your kind of, almost got like a framework you've been thinking about, about reasons students might not know the answer to something. And it could yeah. be lack of knowledge, cognitive load, and so on. So I really like that. And I really like that you were quite brave in the sense that you said, look, it's, it's early days of my thinking on this. So I just, this feels like a good kind of forum to get it out there. So inspired by you, I'm going to talk you through something that's a bit raw in my head at the moment. I don't know how much sense it's going to make, but I'm interested in getting your uh, your take on it. So I'm loosely calling this, because I need a better name for it, I'm all about the names, um, the quadrilogy for worked examples, right? It's my kind of four-stage kind of process for worked examples, because a bit like you, I really like a structure. And of course, you've got our flexibility and so on, but I like something that's going to work in the majority of cases, so I can keep practicing it, I can talk about it, and so on and so forth. So I think it's probably best if I talk you through all four stages, if that's okay. Um, obviously, at any point, if you think, what's he on about there, feel free to kind of cut me off. But I think it's important you kind of I'm see I'm already the confused by the word quadrilogy. I've got to stop you right there, <laughs> Craig. Is that that's even right. a word? Quadril well, it's funny, it's been underlined in red here, which on my notes, which suggests it isn't. I'm sure it's quadrilogy is a word, right? No? I've never heard it, but I, I, I also learned another word this week, which is quackwaversally. Uh, and so if quackwaversally is a word, then I'm sure quad quadrilogy is. I'm going to Google it. Quadrilogy, trilogy, quadrilogy? Nah. Well, I'm going, anyway, I'm going for it. I'm going for it. I think, right, you're, okay. right. I think so, you're right. Right. So I'll go through all four stages, I'll if that's okay, and then we'll we'll see where we're at. Okay. So stage one, you might typically call the I do. Um, and a few kind of kind of points about this. First, um, I would set my board up with the example problem pair kind of set up. So worked example on the left and space for the kind of your turn or whatever we're gonna do later on on the right hand side. As you know through our conversations and our conversations with Michael Pershin, I do my the I do in silence. So I'll use my silent teacher approach. So I'll do a line and then I'll pause and that'll be students prompt to think, what's he just done there? What's he going to do next? So a bit of self-explanation. Um, I'll then do the next line, pause, what's he just done there? What's he going to do next? And so on. Um, when I've got to the end of silent teacher, I'll then do the kind of reflection or narration phase where I'll draw students' attention to kind of critical parts of the example. And I'll say, why did I choose that operation there? Why did I divide by that number and so on and so forth? Um, sometimes I'll involve the kids there, like I'll ask, I'll cold call them or something like that or mini whiteboards. But often I'll just explain myself, like I'll ask the question, pause, and then I'll offer my own explanation to it because I want to kind of really take the lead in, in this kind of phase of, phase of the process. Um, and then the other thing I might do as part of this I do, and I've been experimenting with this recently, is I typically only used to do one example or maybe two examples, but now when I do the I do, I'll try and do, unless it's a really long process, I'll try and do at least two related examples. So expanding brackets is always a classic with this. So maybe I'll the first one I'll do is three brackets X plus two, and then the next one I'll do is maybe three brackets X subtract two, just to draw students' attention to one thing that's changed early, early on in this process. But just to reiterate, the first stage of this process, the I do, the example problem pair setup, It'll be silent teacher going through it. It'll then be some reflections where I draw students' attention to critical parts of the process. And where suitable, I'll do multiple examples which will be related in some way. So that's phase one, I'll, with me so far, yeah? Got it, mate. All right. So phase two, I call step by step. So this is where we'll shift to the right-hand side of the board now. And I'll put a, I'll put a problem up for the, on the board for kids to do, which will be of similar difficulty, no big twists or anything like that. And this, you may call this the we do part of the process, but I call it step by step because I have a very specific way that kids participate um, in this. So I'll say to kids, here's the problem. Um, on your mini whiteboards, I would like you to write me the first step to solving this problem. So it may be, um, what's the first line? It may be, what's the first thing we circle? Whatever I've done as my first step, I want kids to show me that they understand what their first step is. They'll hover the boards, three, two, one, show me. If everybody seems on board with that and it seems fine, I'll just clarify that's the right answer. And then I'll say, okay, now on your boards, right? And I'll copy it on the board myself. And then I'll say, okay, what's your second step in this process? On your boards, three, two, one, show me. And the only other type of participation I'll mess around with during this is call and response. That'll work quite well nicely. So I might say to kids, if we're doing subject to the formula or something like that, I may say to kids, um, 
which of these variables is currently the subject of the formula. I want you to tell me in three, two, one, and then I'll shout out just for a bit of speed. But typically it tends to be mini whiteboards, but the real kind of key part of this is it is step by step. So if something goes wrong, I know exactly where in the process it's, it, it's gone wrong. Okay, so that'll be phase two of the process. Phase three of the process we spoke about a couple of episodes ago, and that's where I do the tick trick from Adam Boxer. So now I'll give my kids a, another example to do. Again, no harder or anything like that. And I'll say, okay, on your mini whiteboards, I want you to do it independently from start to finish. So again, we're kind of loosening the reins a little bit now. They're doing a problem all on their own. I'll then say, right, now I'm going to go through the answer. So the first thing you should have done is this. On your mini whiteboards, tick if you've got exactly what I've got on my board. If you've circled the right thing, if your line looks exactly like my ticket, three, two, one, show me. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. The next thing you should have written is this. Tick on your whiteboard if it looks exactly like that. And as we spoke about a couple of episodes ago, the power of the tick trick for me is it forces kids to not just look at the final answer, but look at the steps in the process. And it's really important if you want kids to set things out in a certain way and so on. It really gets them to focus on the method as opposed to the answer. And then, so that's stage three. So to recap so far, we've got the kind of I do. We've got the step-by-step -step as almost kind of like the we do. We've got the tick trick, which is a little bit more kind of independent for problem from start to finish on their own. And then I'll do something that I've learned from both Michael Pershing um, and also a guy called Craig Latimer, who I interviewed when I did a podcast on how to plan a maths lesson. And this has been a game changer for me, this all. And this might be the most obvious thing you've ever heard in your life. But what I typically would have done at that stage is transition towards independent practice. So some questions would have appeared on the board or a worksheet or whatever. But what I do now is we do a load more mini whiteboard work, but in a very specific way. So I'll say, typically, maybe I'll clean the board at that stage and I'll bang a new problem on and say, OK, on your mini whiteboard, see if you can answer this from start to finish. So they'll do it. Show me, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll say, OK. What if I change the seven to a six on your mini whiteboards with your solution still there? Can you just change your solution as little as possible and you're working out to account for what I've changed? And the kids like this because they can be quite lazy about it. They don't have to do a question from start to finish, but it's quite clever in the sense that they can look and say, OK, the sevens changed from a six. So what impact does that have on line one? What impact does that have on line two? And they can rub things out and show me and blah, blah, blah. And then I say, okay, what happens if I change the X to an X squared? What impact do you think that's going to have? So make these changes and so on and so forth. So I'll do a lot of this what ifs. What if I do this? What if I do that? The other thing I'll do with these kind of this fourth stage of the process is I'll do a reset. So I'll say, okay, clean your boards now. I'm going to clean my board. Here's a new problem for you to do just to make sure that kids aren't kind of attached to just kind of related examples. So I'll chuck a few resets in there and also I'll chuck a few extensions in there. So I might say to the kids, so a good example of this, if I'm doing expanding brackets and we've just done linear terms so far, I'll say to the kids, right, this next example, I don't expect you to get this right because I haven't taught you this. So if you get it wrong, it's not your fault. It's completely my fault. But should we just have a go just for a laugh? Let's see what happens. I'm going to put a, you know, Y squared in there or something like that, or an extra bracket in there or something we haven't explicitly covered so far in this part of the process. And by, by selling it to the kids like that, and the fact that they've built up their confidence up to this point, and the fact that I lower the stakes in the sense that I'm saying, look, if you get this wrong, it's my fault. It's incredible how many kids certainly have a go at it, but also tend to get that question right. And this, this kind of part of the process, it's replaced a lot of the fluency practice for me because what it means is after I've done, you know, five or six examples like this where I'm quickly changing things on whiteboards, I've got a real good sense of where the kids are at. So I can set them off on something more challenging, a problem solving question or something like that, because I don't have to do all that fluency practice, assess where they're at and so on, because I've really got a good sense of where they're up to. Now, this process from start to finish may take 10 minutes, may take 15 minutes, something like that. But these four stages mean that by the end of it, I really know where my kids are at. My kids seem, seem to be really confident. I've got a real good sense that they're putting effort in, they're participating and so on. And it's, again, it's early days for me with this all, but it's, it's proving a bit of a game changer for me. And just final thing I'll say on this, the reason I've been thinking about this is I put a post out on my ED newsletter last week and I asked, um, it was all about participation in lessons. And I asked teachers to reflect on in five stages of a lesson, kind of starter, prerequisite check, worked example, practice and plenary, 
where do they feel kids' participation is at its lowest, where kids can be zoning out, not thinking and so on. And overwhelmingly, it was the explanation worked example phase of the lesson. So it's really made me think of ways to boost that participation, give kids incentive to think, get a sense of their understanding and so on. So that's where I'm at so far. I'll, what, any, any thoughts on that? That's great, Craig. A very, very kind of elegant design that brings together lots of principles of quality instruction. But it's interesting that it kind of came from the question of um, where are students least active? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and a lot of the you know, really quality instruction I've seen in Australia recently, and, and when I came over to the UK last year, it was the way it was improved by increasing the amount of participation within that kind of instructional phase. I guess the only question I have is like, where can I see this in action, Craig? Yeah. So this is what I'm messing around with uh, at the moment. So uh, as, as you know, kind of behind the scenes, I've been emailing you and your, your buddy, Josh Goldridge about best kind of video setup. Cause I want to kind of do a lot more video stuff in lessons, both of me and as part of coaching and so on. So this is something I'm working with, with a couple of the, the teachers that I coach at the moment. So hopefully I'll be able to have some examples to, to show you or show people reasonably soon. But it's, yeah, like it's, again, it's like, like you said with your example that you shared last last time, it's not kind of a catch-all thing. There's got to be flexibility in there. And for certain things, it's going to be perhaps a little bit more tricky. Like you could imagine sim solving simultaneous equations. It's not going to be as easy to get through as many examples and so on and so forth. But I think generally for maths anyway, you can, you can sort out quite a few procedures with this, with, with this approach. I'm excited anyway. That's great. So yeah, that's, that's awesome, Craig. And I would love to see a video of that. Like I'm always looking for, you know, content that shows really quality math instruction. So I will follow you up around, around that. And uh, in fact, I'd love to follow up something uh, from, from a previous chat uh, on kind of relatedly. Uh, and that was both after my chat and your, your chat with me and your chat with peps on the idea of rehearsal in coaching, <laughs> You said, oh, yeah, okay, you guys have convinced me. I'm going to give it more of a go. Can you can you give us a report, Craig? How has the rehearsal been going for you? I've been good, Al, you know. So I've forced, I've forced myself to do this, as I say. And I've done – the first time I did it, I'll be honest, it didn't go as well as I thought, but it was my fault, right, because I didn't do what you said to do, which is, you know – well, firstly, you do something really good, right? Because you show a video, if I'm if I'm not not mistaken here, of you kind of involved in some coaching with I think Mark, one of you, one of your colleagues, some, something like okay. that. Um, so I didn't do that, but I also didn't do the thing that you could also do, which was to kind of preempt it to say, look, as part of this coaching thing, we're going to do a little bit of rehearsal. I'll be honest, the first time I did this, it felt a little bit weird and so on, but it's been the single most powerful thing that's changed my way. I didn't do any of that stuff, right? I just dived straight in and they were like, what the hell is this? And I, I was, be honest, I was like, well, yeah, I don't know why I'm doing this, right? So it was a disaster, right? But the second time I did it, I did it with, um, it was part of some mini whiteboard work that we were doing. So just a really kind of simple bit of coaching that we were doing, which was to get kids and this is, I'm big into this, to get kids to get book work onto mini whiteboard. So I call it, I call it book to board because I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get like Adam Box and Douglas off with these catchy, catchy phrases. So I've got book to board here. So the idea being like when kids are doing a do now, they're doing the workout in the books, but then when you want to assess whether they know the answer to question three or whatever, get your book work onto your board, just copy your final answer. So that felt like something that we could rehearse because it was, it didn't feel as awkward as the teacher kind of cold call into an empty classroom, it was like, no, I can see how this can work. I can practice the instructions I'm given. And then I can actually use some of the questions that we've planned in this do now to see whether it's feasible to copy the answers down and so on. So it worked really well there. So I think where I'm at at the moment is that I'm on board with rehearsal being important. I'm going to get myself, I'm going to get better at kind of selling them with the dream of rehearsal. And I'm going to just for the time being, make sure I do ones that I think are really kind of suitable to it in terms of that kind of practical aspect. So hopefully I haven't completely failed all, but I've, yeah, I've given it a go. That's awesome. That's great to hear, Craig. And book to board, very catchy. I like it. Interesting. It's something I, I ended up doing quite a bit with my starters, especially last year with my, my year 12s. We'd often have five or six kind of multiple choice past exam questions that they'd start with. They'd come in, do them on paper, and then I'd say, okay, 10 minutes is up. Question one, what did you get? Three, 
two, one, show me. And it's so great because it can be like, you can quickly make a note of the two students who got it wrong, or if five students get it wrong or 10, you can go, okay, time to go through this. But if you don't have to go through one, you can just like keep moving and it's super efficient. And it also enables like, if a student finishes early the book work, or the, in this case, the do now, they can actually go onto some book work, uh, but then still do the feedback in unison with the other students so yeah, you get the nice. best of best of both worlds in terms of that pacing so nice that you've um you've started doing that too and even better given it a cool name love it right